Over the past few weeks, there have been a ton of whisperings about Bloodborne 2, most of them fueled by this doll you find in Deracine, from Software's new VR title. Do you reckon it's trying to tell us something? It is making contact, after all, and this doll is definitely the same one as in Bloodborne. The question you have to ask yourself is, does this confirm Bloodborne 2, or is Vardy just tricking me into watching his Deracine content? Here's the doll's description. A doll of the stone girl Fiona, who appears in the unfinished tale. When a person has a bad dream, Fiona appears and helps them flee. The name Fiona is likely a homage to Fiona MacLeod, whose poetry inspired De Racine. But regardless of the name, this is still our plain old doll from Bloodborne, who appears in our terrible dream and who helps us survive the night. But most notably, they say this doll appears in the unfinished tale, and this quote is where things get interesting. At first I thought this doll was just an easter egg, right? Just a mention of Bloodborne. But now it feels like they're trying to tell us something, and calling Bloodborne unfinished could really mean two things, I think. First, it could mean that they consider the story unfinished and that they plan on finishing it, or they could be saying that they have no plans of finishing it and the Bloodborne is just designed to be an unfinished story. Because some stories are unfinished by design. This allows the player to fill in the gaps for themselves and think up a satisfying conclusion to their favourite series. At the end of Dark Souls 3, for example, when you head into the painting to escape a dying world, you have no idea where the story could go, and that's a nice ending in a way. Bloodborne 2 has very open endings, so remember, Calling Bloodborne unfinished doesn't confirm Bloodborne 2, but it has made it more likely. Personally, I think From Software is saying, we aren't done with Bloodborne, and our work is yet to be finished. I think it's less of a question of whether they want to do it, and I think it's more a question of when. Earlier this year, Miyazaki said there was no plan for more Dark Souls or Bloodborne games, However, he also said he would be open to the possibility of doing sequels in the future, and since Sony was impressed by Bloodborne's sales and clearly values the IP, I think that's most likely where we stand. I think they have an idea for what they'd like to do with Bloodborne, and while I doubt that it's in super active development right now, I bet we'll see more from this series, at least in time for the PlayStation 5, which is estimated to release in 2020, because Bloodborne is a really strong IP to drive hardware sales with. So, if Bloodborne were to have a sequel, where would the story go next? Well, there are actually more clues in De Racine. So, by the river of prayer, in a scene where Yulia cradles some living things and then sets them adrift down the river, we find this statuette of something called a seafaring sage. A statuette of a seafaring sage that appears in an unfinished tale. It is said to appear in bad dreams, to watch over those who attempt to leave. So obviously this description mirrors that of the Fiona doll, and these two characters together bring back memories of the childhood's beginning ending, which is the one where the doll cradles us after defeating the moon presence after we've become an infant great one. In fact, this ending is actually referenced in De Racine's credits as well, which proves that the seafaring sage is indeed our player character when we were reborn as an infant great one. So, in the same breath that From Software is calling Bloodborne unfinished, they're also specifically referencing this ending. That seems pretty curious, right? All of a sudden, this ending feels very canon to me. And if the description is to be taken literally, then our character, like the doll, will henceforth appear in bad dreams to watch over those who leave the dream. This always was the most significant ending of Bloodborne, after all. It's the ending where our character becomes able to lift humanity into its next childhood, and maybe it will sort of help humanity go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the great ones. And calling us a seafaring sage is also interesting, Obviously this is just speculation, but perhaps the word seafaring means that we can cross the seas to other lands. And I've always thought that a Bloodborne 2 sequel would kind of need to branch out to a new setting in order to keep things fresh. Because unlike the Souls games, Bloodborne largely takes place in a gothic Victorian setting 
which is like an incredible setting, don't get me wrong, but two games in one environment would be a bit too much, I think. Uh, earlier this year, we actually speculated that Shadows Die Twice could potentially be a Bloodborne game based in feudal Japan, and while we were kind of wrong on that, I still would love to see how the Great Ones could influence other parts of the world and work their way into different cultural folklore. Which brings us around to what I think is the final Bloodborne reference in De Racine, something that hasn't been talked about too much online, just because of how damn difficult it is to find in-game. So towards the end of the game, tucked into Marie's folded laundry, is a book called Blood and Bones. It depicts this really tribal looking warrior on the cover, who looks towards the sun in the sky with an eagle flying overhead and another eagle type of bird uh, perched on his shoulder. His left hand looks as if it's either holding or has been replaced by two claws, and they look a lot like the beast claws of Bloodborne. The book reads, prose of some terrible tale. This fabled land of gold, silver, and sacrifices owed both its rise and fall to its inhuman warriors. They applied face paint brewed from blood, giving them the strength of the gods, and carved up their own bones, crafting the weapons of the gods. Yet their legacy is neither here nor there. We're going into some deep speculation territory on this one, but it's good speculation. This theory that I'm about to propose comes across pretty well, but I'm curious to see what you think. So I'm going to try and convince you that this book could be a theme and setting for a new Bloodborne title, or if not a Bloodborne title, at least a new From Software game. So let's start with those claws that were on the cover. If they are indeed the beast claws from Bloodborne, then that would make them a weapon that has been crafted from the bones of an undead dark beast. The claws and the dark beasts in Bloodborne are both found in the Loran Chalice Dungeon, and Loran is described as a tragic land that was long ago devoured by the sands. And the description of an ancient desert city devoured by the sands lines up with a few other elements on the cover. Everything from the enormous sun in the sky, to the attire of the character, to the eagles soaring through the air. So a lot of the separate elements on the cover actually mesh really well with what we know about the Loran Chalice Dungeon. And I think the best theory that you can get from all of this is that it's possible that Bloodborne 2 could be a prequel and that it could be set in Loran before it was consumed by the sands. Again, that's just speculation, but the concept and how well everything works together there really makes me excited. Loran and the Chalice Dungeons actually have a sort of architecture to them, which suits a lot of the architecture in Mesoamerican cultures, like the Mayans and the Aztecs and the Incans. And, as we'll talk about, a lot of the concepts in Blood and Bones actually speak to those cultures. But I'm gonna do my best to put aside Loran and Bloodborne 2 for a moment, and just try to sort of convince you that the book is at least referencing a lot of elements of Mesoamerican culture, so the Incans, the Mayans, and the Aztecs. A long time ago, some of you might remember, there was actually a spattering of rumors that From Software's next game was going to be titled Phantom Whale, and it was apparently going to be a game with a very Mayan or Aztec aesthetic. At the time, me and a lot of other people thought these rumors were stupid as hell because they were clearly overlapping with an existing game called Absolver, which you might know of. So I can't actually believe I'm having second thoughts about those rumors now because the few clues in this Blood and Bones book really, really match the culture of Mesoamerican tribes. So first, the description mentions a fabled land of gold and silver and the peoples of ancient America endowed gold with a very spiritual and symbolic meaning. For example, the Inca thought of gold as the reign of the sun, which was considered a god to them, and the Aztecs who came after the Incans, their emperors controlled many mines and workshops, and they gifted gold objects and ornaments to exceptionally brave soldiers. So that's one link. The second link is that the description goes on to mention face paint brewed from blood, and these cultures did have an extensive history of body decoration. That's probably one of the weaker links, but it's still a link. But perhaps most importantly, the description mentions sacrifice and inhuman warriors, which resonates really strongly with Mesoamerica, because a lot of these cultures had strong military structures and a lot of focus on sacrifice. 
For the Aztecs in particular, their god of sun and war required regular nourishment, and he got that in the form of freshly harvested human hearts. And as the self-proclaimed people of the sun, the Aztecs really victimized their neighboring tribes, uh, one of which was called the Tlaxcala people, who ended up becoming the bulk of the sacrifices that were made to the sun god of the Aztecs. And in the end, this treatment of their neighbors may well have been their downfall, because when the Spaniards invaded with the intent of wiping out the Aztecs in the early 16th century, they formed alliances with the neighboring tribes who hated the Aztecs for very good reason. So they used that hatred of the Aztecs to their advantage, and they all eventually overcame the Aztec civilization and completely wiped it out. And you know why I'm mentioning this bit of history? It's because the Aztecs owed both their rise and fall to their inhuman warriors who terrorized and angered their neighbors, just like the book Blood and Bones states. So I'm actually not the first one to think of a lot of these connections. A bunch of people over on Reddit have had similar thoughts as well, which I think lends a bit of credibility to these theories. And there's a lot of excitement about this online, or at least I think there should be, because of all the video game settings, think about it, Mayan and Aztec cultures get really, really scant representation, and there's a lot of unexplored potential there, especially since these civilizations were kind of mysterious. So personally, my fingers are crossed for some Aztec trick weaponry, or at least a return to the world of Bloodborne in the next few years. Anyway, before I go, I want to let you guys know that I'm finally going to start streaming on Twitch. Don't worry, this won't affect YouTube at all, except that I might shout out my stream a little bit, and maybe I'll debut some videos over on Twitch with a live audience. I think that would be really cool. Um, how often I stream will depend on how much I end up liking it, but I got some fun ideas for streams I'd like to do. I really want to do a randomized run of Dark Souls, and some other modded versions of the game, and maybe just play some games I enjoy playing in my free time, the most recent of which is Artifact, the new card game by Valve. Uh, the most fun part though has been designing the stream. I got to commission so much art, and when I commission a lot of art and I have a lot of artwork coming at me every day that I can look at, that makes me really happy. And I have a sub button already, I have some emotes already, which I'm really happy with, uh, so go and check it out. And I'll see you next time for Prepare to Cry, I think.